Ronnie Chan, welcome to BRI Dialogues. Oh, thank you. It's uh, November 29, 2022, and we're delighted to have you all the way with us, albeit virtually from Hong Kong. So um, I want to kick off with a question just to perhaps set the scene. Would you agree, would it be fair to say that the West still perceives China as a nation state and as a party? Is there a missing in optics and the way the West sees China as a 3,500 year old civilization state and not just a nation state or a party? And if that is the case, how can you know a country of 234 years old as the United States who has been itself uh, herself at the forefront of setting the agenda for global order miss this fact and how this can be reconciled? Well, Ali, I think that's um, a longer term uh, factor to today's difficulty and there's a shorter term one. The longer term one is was implied in your question and that is, uh, is China a nation state? China never saw itself as a nation state. Uh, in their, in her part of the world, she was almost the only state. Uh, moreover, as the former MIT professor Lucian Pai, PYE, the late Lucian Pai said, China is a civilization which pretends to be a nation state. It is so big, historically so um, civilizationally advanced that it is really not a nation state a la you know, 1648 Europe. is not that kind of a nation state. And I don't think that too many people understand that because they are not that. I will never un understand a chimpanzee because I'm not a chimpanzee. Uh, if you're not a nation state, it, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, to intuitively feel it. And so that's the first one. Ch China became very weak as a whatever state uh, for the last 300 years before you know the last couple of decades. And so you have a nation state uh, or a civilizational state that has gone to hell. And then it's recovery. And it has no, cho no choice but to join the nation state family. And so it's, you may say it has to learn to become a nation state. Uh, and the rest of the world has to accept it as a nation state uh, and perhaps even one day understand it as a civilizational state. That's a longer term issue. The shorter term issue is that the last 70 years, at least 70, 80 years since World War II, if not since First World War, uh, the United States have been at the top of the world. It's just no denying that. And for the most part, there has been a force of good uh, for much of the world. But when you are on top for so long, you have a little problem having somebody share the stage with you. You always think that somebody's trying to unseat you. Even if all they want is to share a stage with you, just like many other nation states. And America just cannot share uh, the, state, the stage with anybody who is that big. And so I think that's a shorter term problem. I, I uh, thank you so much, Ronnie, for that. I guess you could, you could using your metaphor, the, the Americans and the European allies set the stage, if you like. And in a sense, they are the directors of this stage. And in that sense, it's very difficult for them to countenance other, other actors appearing on that stage. But there is much discussion about um, not China not being an alternative power, as it were, to the United States, that I know China doesn't want to be seen in those terms in any case, but rather as a reordering power that, that again, to use your metaphor, to move the stage on a bit to a different place. Do you think China has that intention at heart? And if so, what kind of instruments and tools would Beijing be using to continue with what it calls its peaceful rise? Well, first of all, allow me, Anush, to uh, moderate a little bit what you have just said. 
is that you know China, uh, the U.S. and Europe countries are that directing this. Uh, not really. It's the United States directing. Europe is just following. I, I'm sorry. I know you are from England, and uh, I'm sorry you're not that important yet. Uh, so it's really the United States directing, right? Uh, as far as the Chinese intention is concerned, uh, my problem with that kind of that line of thinking is that the West, because of civilizational differences, only can think along that line that you have portrayed. That is, who's number one and who's not number one. In particular in America, and I lived there for many years, know a little bit about the situation, the culture. If you're number one, you're number one. And if you have number two, you're number nothing. It's all or none. And, you know, in the Asian civilization, in particular the Chinese civilization, there is a clear word for champion, number one, and then a clear word for number two, and number three, number four. Guan Jun, Ya Jun, Ji Jun, Dian Jun. So if you're number four, you're still somebody. Whereas in the West in particular, in the American scheme of things, uh, you have to be number one and number one and number one. And if you're number two, you're nobody. So when the Soviet Union became a uh, you know, the more or less co-number one, he had to put, put it down. Whether they are real dangerous or not, I don't know. Eventually, history showed that they are not as strong as they really were, the Soviet Union. When Japan became powerful in the 1980s, America had this Plaza Accord, for example, that tried its best to put it down. Now, it's a lot easier to put down Japan because Japan relies on the United States in too many things, in particular security. Whereas China is a, it's a different animal. Right. The rest of the world has to get... Just never seen it before. You, you, you know, just like it's a black swan. People have never seen a black swan. So people have never seen a big whatever. Right. And that is that big and that powerful or potentially that powerful. And it's scared the heck of the, out of the West who think in that zero-sum game fashion. So I think that you know, the rest of the world has to get used to China and China has to get used to the rest of the world. And to answer more directly your question, uh, I have always said this for the last 30 years. China was very, very happy to play second fiddle to the United States mm. for two reasons. Number one, China knew that it's for 300 years it has been in hell. So the world is led by the West, in particular by the United States since the, second, the, the 20th century. So it is the world system now. You have to accept that and live with it. Mm. And so China is very happy to play the second fiddle. That's number one. Number two, China knows that anybody, just China read history. And anybody who get on the wrong side of America usually don't have a good ending. Right. And so China knew that. And so China was very happy to play second fiddle. But the United States cannot accept that because American way of thinking is all or none. I suppose it may have to do with a little bit of the civilizational history, you know, the, 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 the Judeo-Christianity background is very evangelical and is very binary. It's heaven or hell, right? Um, um, salvation and perdition, God or the devil, is only one or the other. It's no such thing called one and the other. Right. And so, you know, that uh, kind of orientation uh makes accepting China very, very different, uh, very difficult. And China only have been bending backwards for decades and decades to accommodate the United States, to follow the United States. I would, if you were forced me to put a line, I would say the Alaska meeting, it's not just how bad the argument became. It is the, the reason behind that meeting and then subsequently what happened in the meeting that I say that was a line uh, that divides the, uh, the, the, the world and a pre-Alaska uh, world and a post-Alaska world. Absolutely fascinating, Ronnie. Absolutely fascinating. So, so 
if China is content with where it is in the world, and it's obviously other people's problem to come to terms with that, given that there is this measure of not so long a disguised hostility towards towards China, uh, is it fair then to say that China is now carving other geopolitical uh, relationships and maybe the BRI is part and parcel of this kind of, I think maybe too strong a word to put restructuring, but also looking at creating these other geopolitical alliances, partnerships is what the language that, that uh, Beijing uses. Do you think that is part of this China's recognition of where it is in the world, where it would like to be in the world, and how the dominant powers don't accept where it is in the world? Sorry, I don't a believe clumsy, so. bit of a clumsy question there. I don't believe so, Anush. Let me tell you one. China has always been, you know, since the 1950s, when they were still really economically and in, 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 in nowhere, economically in hell. Uh, since the 50s, the China, China has always been for, you know, uh, non-alliance, always working with the third world countries, India, you know, Africa, uh, and, and so forth. It is still doing exactly the same thing, isn't it? And do you think that China has a, uh, has a chance of winning over uh, the Five Eye? I don't think so. I think that which is interesting is the rest of the European country besides the, uh, the United Kingdom. And, you know, where they go, it's going to be the term, determining factor. And uh, I believe, I, I, I don't for a moment believe that Western Europe would, uh, apart from the UK, would necessarily go with the United States for many reasons. Number one, America has been too much of a bully, let's face it, right? And, and, and even towards its allies, such as your Western European countries. And so they have been at the short end of the stick. Uh, they, they dare not say it, but they know it. And most other people knew it. And number two, you know, you have economic realities in the world. And number three, Western Europe, while still ideological, is not as evangelical as the United States is. And so uh, I think that for all those reasons and probably more, uh, Europe is going to be very important in the world. I always say that Western Europe is nothing. Western Europe is, you know, uh, in hell and, uh, you know, not no longer uh, a, a player in, in the total scheme of things. But I, two years ago, three years ago, I changed my mind. I said, I think now Europe is back uh, for various reasons, but they are back. Ronnie, well, it's fascinating and the way you, um, how do you say, unpack these intertwined intricacies. But I wanted to ask you and exactly on the subject of Europe. I'm sure you've heard about this latest uh, IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, that the United States has passed in subsidies uh, of paying $369 billion to companies that get into green manufacturing and cheap energy to come to the United States. So a lot of European companies are finding themselves that if they want to access that market, they have to manufacture and have a physical presence in the United States. So Europe is finding it in the hard way that particularly after, you know, the crisis of Ukraine and cut of gas, that it's being shortchanged in this relationship. On one side, they're saying, cut your ties to China and then pack in, you know, St. Gobans of the world, you know, uh, BASFs of the world. In the meantime, China's, you know, um, Reform and Development Council has opened from 480 to 590 sectors open to FDI. If Europe were to choose between us or against us, how will it be able to manage the weight of China and the existing, I would say, commitments to the United States? Well, at the end of the day, Europe has to balance the two. Let me tell you a little anecdote. When I was a kid, you know, 12, 14 year old, one day my, I, 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 I got into an argument with the, with the, the lady, a, a house helper. And my father called me into his room and said, son, don't you know who you are? I have no idea what it would meant. 
He said, don't you know that you're, you know, you're my son. You're the boss, so to speak, of this house. Why do you have to get into an argument with that lady? Right? Why don't you be a little extra gracious? Be a little nicer. Right? And then people will respect you even the more. So I learned that since I was a kid. Now, how well I learned is another thing, but anyway, let's not get into that. And so, you know, America is doesn't seem to have learned that. That, you know, when you are on top of the world, so much the more you have to be, shall I say, a little humble, at least in behavior, right? Be a little gracious, and it goes a long way. But America doesn't seem to understand that. 70 years ago, after World War II, it did. And in recent decades, it did not. And it coincided, of course, with the not waning of the United States. I don't for a moment believe that America has waned. I think it's just the relative weight, re relative, relative weight of the various countries in the world has inevitably changed. Because after World War II, America was by far the dominant country in the world economically and otherwise. And so as a relative weight changes, America is losing self-confidence, and that's a bad thing. If you are as powerful as the United States, and yet you lose self-confidence, then a lot of terrible things can happen. And so America has been behaving, you know, like a brat, even towards its allies, so to speak, its historic mm -hmm. friends. And... So now, you know, America first is not just against China, but America first is to everybody. So even Europe. And so that will only force the Europeans to have to choose, ultimately, perhaps in a way that America didn't want it. And it is, I mean, just like interpersonal relationship. If you don't treat another person well, you're not going to have a friend. That guy's going to turn against you. Or at least he's going to walk away from you. And so I think that, you know, United States as a nation that is that powerful, that that wealthy, ought to be a lot more gracious. Uh, but it has not been. And that really forces, I believe, the Europeans to, it's a big consideration on the part of the Europeans eventually, to if they walk away from the United States, which I think they may have to. Uh, and that's also because I my long held belief that you know, America is going to move toward isolationism, which is the root of its nationhood anyway. But anyway, that's uh, an additional issue. That, that, that is the hot potato that I'm going to pass right back to you, Ronnie, in the following terms. So, so let's bring in the, the, uh, the devil in the detail here and, and go forth with your argument that actually, yes, there is a degree of kind of, you know, a cleavage developing between Europe and United States. Ali and I have grappled with notions of decoupling for a very long time. Uh, much of commentators look at decoupling as an American Chinese phenomena. What you've brought in is the European dimension here, which we think is really significant because like you, we think that Europe is a major pillar in the world economy, but also for all sorts of historical political reasons as well. So. Are you suggesting, are you intimating that we've got decoupling, decoupling kind of skewed, that decoupling could be taking place across the Atlantic at the same time as between China and the United States? I have long said that, Anush. I have long said that there is a rift in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that is long in the making. A lot of things are unbeknown to, you know, uh, Am amateur like me, but you just hear here, you hear a little here, hear a little there, and you realize that the Europeans are not happy in many, many dimensions with the way the United States have treated them. Now, for the time being, because of the Ukrainian war, that they were forced to, for a while, come back together. But that is per mainly in the security side of things. In the economic side of things, that's another story. And so I think that uh, the decoupling, if you will, uh, is already happening. Moreover, I believe at the end of the day, uh, America doesn't want 
not just doesn't just want to decouple with China, which is happening. America will also want to decouple with Europe. You may think, ah, Europe doesn't want to decouple with America uh, unless forced to. True. But America has a strong tendency toward isolationism. The country was never founded in internationalism. It's always founded in isolationism. And so for America to move in that direction, it's just to go back to our old habit, that's all. Hmm. And the fact that you and I were both born and raised after World War II, when America was, shall we say, forced into internationalism, we're not used to thinking what America really is. But all the way from the, you know, the old days of the Monroe Doctrine, the Roosevelt Corollary, you know, uh, exceptionalism, a lot of things over the last 20 years, that America has this strong tendency toward isolationism. And I believe that domestic, American domestic issue, together with international problems, perhaps a third one that is maybe some natural disasters, which can hit anybody anytime. So a combination of those forces may yet force, will, will yet cause America to move in that direction toward isolationism faster. Then, if you are Europe, you are left with, what are you, what are you left with? Vis-a-vis -vis Russia, militarily, security-wise, you have an issue. Economically, right? Vis-a-vis -vis China and the rest of the world, you have, a, you have a problem. So Europe has to position itself today in order to protect its own self-best interest, isn't it? Ronnie, I am a bit baffled by a number of the new acronyms that the United States and West are creating on a daily basis. Build Back a Better World, CHIP4, AUKA, Squad. And I sometimes, I know that you are sought after, you're taught, your wisdom as somebody who knows East and West intimately. Very few people around the world, Ronnie, I'm not saying this to please you because you have graced us with your presence today, are from East and yet understand the United States that deeply, right? So I want to put it this way. How can somebody come up with the latest one on semiconductors and, you know, microchips, whereas 80% of the capacities upstream, downstream in rare earths, in processing, in foundries, are all within the correlation of the ecosystem that China has created. And to say, we want to cut them off. Is that more a bit of a Chuck Norris movies, you know, the karate movies, and China is in Tai Chi mode, and, you know, it's, this, there is reciprocity, there is retaliation. How can one cut his or his allies' nose without understanding that intertwined interdependency? Well, I won't read too much into Chuck Norris versus uh, Tai Chi or whatever <laughs> Kung Fu. <laughs> uh, enough, I don't. I, I, I don't want to put too much on a uh, a cultural uh, dimension of it. Maybe there's a little bit of that, but I think for the most part, uh, it is really practical realities of security of economics uh, of you know political gains and this and that and and let's also forget not forget one thing and that is in history is full of very very smart people who do very very dumb things very very smart very very smart people who hurt themselves unnecessarily history is full of it and sorry to say, we are seeing another great nation today doing exactly that. You know, for example, you, you, you know, lock up people's account and, and you don't pe let people trade through uh, uh, Swift and so forth. Who get hurt? I said, th these are uh, uh, economic nuclear weapons. You use it when you have no more choice. You have to use it, right? And sorry to say this, I said, who is Russia? Russia's economy is smaller than Italy or, 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 or Korea, right? So, of course, they have you know, a lot of security, a, a lot of uh, weapons. But they're not threatening the United States. And so you use the nuclear weapon that hurt yourself at the end of the day more than you hurt Russia. Russia, it, sorry to say, is not that big of a strong of a country. So if you heard it, you heard it. 
But who is strong? America is strong. And if you hurt America, now that's big. And America, as far as I can see, is hurting itself while it's hurting the other guy. And, you know, would people trust U.S. dollar anymore? Would people, you know, in the old days, whenever there's a problem in the world anywhere, money runs to the United States or at least runs to the U.S. dollar. And from now on, would anybody, in your, your allies included, or perhaps your allies in particular, would ask themselves the question, hey, when is it my turn to be sanctioned by America? And so eventually, nobody will trust America anymore. And who is diminishing the moral authority hard earned from World War II? Who's de dim uh, diminishing the credibility of the United States, which was great after World War II? It's the United States itself. And if the people don't trust the US dollar anymore, who is who 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 get hurt the most? The United States get hurt the most. And so I think that very sad. I, I was always hopeful that, you know, of all countries, if there's one country that can to can be elevated uh from these tit for tat, you know, these foolish things, is America. I was also always hopeful. And after all, America is wealthy. And so we can afford to do a little bit more in this direction. And I have been disappointed that mm. I thought that America was, you know, Marshall Plan and this and that. You know, they did a lot of good things to a lot of people. Of course, Marshall Plan is very much Soviet Union related. But anyway, but at least I thought that America is more self-enlightened. Apparently not. Empire come, empire go. And we are just seeing another big country hurting itself. <coughs> which I think is very, very sad. I have a dollar question and currency question, but I wait for Anush and then I weave in. Go yeah. ahead, Anush. Yeah, Ali, you're not going to get your own way yet. Uh, <laughs> Ronnie, Ron, you've used, you used the, the, the word trust several times in, in the conversation that we are having, uh, which is a really important uh, word to use uh, in politics, but also in business. And it's the business side of it that obviously is of direct interest to you. And we are very interested in your take on this. Um, so if trust is being eroded um, at the, if you like, at the, at the, the, the commanding heights of the world economy, is that why, for want of a better term, middle ranking countries are looking at something like the BRICS, even though I don't think BRICS has been particularly full of uh, valor, uh, nevertheless, it's out there and it's got some serious players in it. Is it concerns to do with trust within the economic realm that now seems to be piquing the interest of middle powers all the way from Indonesia to Turkey and Iran and others? What's your take on that? Well, if you're a middle country, <clears throat> middle range country, <clears throat> you are always looking for a big brother, right? You're not big enough economically, politically, militarily, in many other ways <clears throat> uh, to stand alone. So you need either a neighbor or a big, big um, power to lean on. And <clears throat> that's why ASEAN, for example, right? The neighborhood try to get together. And it's a... You know, Quite an interesting case, very successful story. <clears throat> but then if you're Indonesia, as you mentioned, you must be asking yourself a question. Or if you're small countries like Singapore, which, you know, uh, always <clears throat> about this weight class, <clears throat> and you, would, you must be asking the question, who is more trustworthy? Is the United States trustworthy? Or is China more trustworthy? Now, America is you know, ramping up the, the media machine <laughs> to tell the world that China is, is not, you know, trustworthy. But don't underestimate people's intelligence. The Singaporeans and the Indonesians, the Thai, Thai and the, they are not, they, they are smart. And when they see what's happening in the rest of the world, how the United States treats others, how the United States, right, uh, are so bullying everyone. Do you think that they would trust the United States? Now, who is the alternative? Well, China is one alternative. 
China is a big market, among other things. No doubt, when you're big, people are afraid of you. Anybody who's that big, people are afraid of you. I'm a small guy, nobody is afraid of me. But if my name is Shaq O'Neal, right, uh, everybody's afraid of me. And so China, it's obvious that people get afraid of big guys. But that said, they will also look at the, the other side of the equation, right? What is the benefit? How big is your market? Can I access it, right? And have you been fulfilling your international obligations? And it is not difficult to make a case that China is far more trustworthy than the United States. And so, I mean, India, for example, is in a very difficult position, right? A very embarrassing position. And the worst, the most embarrassing, not worst, the most embarrassing position is probably Japan. And so, you know, a lot of these countries uh, have to reassess the whole world. In the, the, the post-World War II world was an easy one. You know, you rely on other Soviet Union, or well, nobody rely on the Soviet Union, you rely on the United States, right? Uh, well, Russia, uh, India did a little bit. Uh, India, India did quite a bit in those days. And so you, uh, you know, it's easy. But today, as the existing big power, once upon a time, a very friendly power, uh, is becoming more and more of a bully. And then you have another guy who has a pretty track record of honoring contracts and so forth, and has a big market. And so I can easily see many of these middle-range countries having to choose uh, to side with China. And as Singapore has always said, Please don't make us, don't force us to choose, because otherwise the result may not be what America wants. And America is tone deaf. I mean, I'm so powerful. I'm so powerful. It's impossible. Everybody will trust me. And if you don't trust me, they have no choice because I'm big. I'm strong. Right? And when when that goes on again and again and again, uh, and then the, in the old days, there's no alternative. Now there may be an alternative. So it's it, it, it's really, nobody can defeat America. Only one country. That's America. And sadly, we're seeing America defeating itself right now. It hurts me to see that. Ronnie, I want to take the conversation just a step back to two elements. Um, one is the dollar role and uh, Tina, there is no alternative. What I've come to see, or the world at large, perhaps in the past six months, is that the real currency, in more ways than one, is energy, is commodities, is, you know, fertilizers, wrongly or rightly. And this role of you cannot access our markets, we apply sanctions on you. Then you see JP Morgan, Black Rocks of the world are running for the savings of Chinese and their, you know, uh, uh, pillow money and to have access to those markets. Then you will see on the automotive front, for instance, people like Warren Buffett have invested heavily in BYD, build your dream, your EV cars that are coming and being a contender. Again here, where is this currency dynamic is going? And if China and the middle powers, as you and Anush eloquently, both of you touched and addressed it, want to create a, a parallel you know, non-exposed flow of capital. Is there not a risk that the United States will come back again in another desperate move and say, oh, excuse me, true that you're not accessing dollars, but it's all going through, you know, under Atlantic or Pacific cable. So if you're using my infrastructure, even if it's in renminbi, ruble or real or rand, you still cannot do it. Where does this come to collide from a currency point of view? Well, I won't be too surprised if America will do further things that are um, <clears throat> very short-sighted. That is, at the end, not good for America itself. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, okay, you can trade an RMB or whatever, a euro, but we don't, we, we start access to commodities and what have you, right, through other means. I mean, those kind of things, uh, you know, when you are, when you're really hot, when you're really upset, when you're mad, you really make wrong decisions. And to me, America has been mad. 
toward Russia, toward China, it's the temper is hot. And the temperature is hot. Up here is hot. And when that is the case, you're not cool headed, you don't make right decisions. And you don't think through problems. For example, I'll just give you one. When America stopped, uh, well, basically forced Europe to buy energy from Russia, did you think about what will happen to China and the relationship between Russia and China? Probably not. At least they didn't assess it adequately. And so it solves, in some ways, China's energy problem. While China is your number one enemy, not Russia. And why are you helping China? I don't get it. Right? Uh, China needs food. Well, Russia has food besides energy. And now you're helping China. So are you trying to hurt China or are you trying to help China? So when you try to hurt Russia, are you forgetting that elephant in the room, which is frankly not Russia, frankly it's China, as far as America is concerned, right? Or inflation. Did they think through the issue of inflation? Did they expect it, inflation to go up like that? The world, the world, in particular the West, cannot afford inflation because of the so much QE1, QE2, QE3, right? I said in Hong, living in Hong Kong growing up, I only know QE2. You know what is QE2, right? Queen Elizabeth II, right? That's the only QE we know. And now you have QE7, QE10, whatever it is. And the world is awash in money. Much of the Western country have been doing that, China included, but China has been absorbing it over the last 10, 15 years. But not in the West, they cannot, not in America. And so now America is pouring fuel to the fire of inflation. So who can not afford higher inflation? Well, who has the most debt? Right? Interest rate goes up. And who has the most debt? America. So at the end, I think some of these pragmatic uh, considerations is the only thing that will pull the United States back from its own um, own, I don't want to use the word demise, but the own uh, problem that is it has created for itself. And so I think, you know, anyway, uh, you know, back to your earlier point, uh, when you tell, when you do whatever you do to stop energy uh, flow from Russia to Western Europe, what, what do you expect the Western Europe to do? Right? Oh. You got to consider not just your own good, but your your other's good, your friend's good, and they are after all supposedly your friend. And you know, is America thinking about selling LNG to Western Europe, and at what price? And so the Europeans are upset. Hey, I'm paying several times what I used to pay, right? Uh, and 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 who benefits? As you alluded, uh, alluded to, it, Anush, the United States is benefiting from it. So I think America should be a little bit more gracious to other people uh, rather than you know trying to take all. When you're powerful like America, it's important that you, 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 you keep the moral standing among uh, the, uh, your friends, right? And it doesn't seem, seem to be happening. The other thing, Ronnie, is that um, just a quick one, there is a massive run uh, of course, after this IRA in European capitals about how they're going to respond, made in Europe, buy in Europe, and all of that. But there is a tremendous movement, at least from German car manufacturers, and I don't want to keep the conversation on cars. We have to slowly shift to real estate as well, because you're the sage on real estate in Asia Pacific. But, 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 but no, no, no. But, but, but there is tremendous... Um, I would say, strategic alliances between big auto manufacturers and Chinese auto manufacturers. So rightly, as you right mentioned, they're, they're decoupling or hedging, et cetera. One thing I wanted to quickly ask from you is that you talk about this being graceful, but this perpetual printing since Nixon times of dollars, 
is there's no end to it, Ronnie. As a matter of fact, I think it will accelerate. With $369 billion of IRA, this Inflationary Reduction Act, the name is oxymoron, Inflationary Reduction Act, but we produce and print money for you to come and manufacture here, is $1 billion a day, Ronnie. How can this come to an end? Uh, <clears throat> So what, what, what's your question? How can how, how can this printing machine stop? Who will nobody's going to stop that, Ronnie? The printing will continue. They're not going to stop printing and quantitative easing, right? Right. Well, you know, if you were to read history, which I'm no expert on, but you know, you read a little bit of history, and as I mentioned, the rise and fall of nations or rise and fall of empires. And that's one way is for you to be printing your money to hell. Ray <laughs> Dalio talks about that a lot. Your, 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 the value goes down, your inflation goes up, right? And that's uh, the way uh, the West, in particular the United States, is rushing towards. And the reason, one of the biggest reasons why America cannot cope, in my opinion, is its own view of itself. It is self-view. And it is the self-righteousness, if you will, to put it more bluntly, that I am the incarnation of righteousness. My system is the best. And no other system is allowed to compete with mine. Not recognizing that America is gone against the founding father's advice and the democracy in America is getting out of hand. Meaning that they are moving farther and farther away from the, the nation's founding father's thought and principles of, you know, how a democracy can work. And now you see the worst of it. And for one person's self-interest, he or she can do things in total disregard for the national good. And that's the easiest in the, in, the, in the international space because nobody, nobody in America cares, right? But for my own political reason, I do this, I do that, I say this, I say that, right? Maybe Nancy Pelosi's visiting Taiwan was in the ilk, I don't know. And, and when, when that, and, and, and some people even say, well, we cannot control her, really? And, 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 and so any one person can, for his or her self-interest, sell out the interest of the nation. And is that what democracy is all about? And so there must be safeguards against that kind of behavior. And there must be some uh, systemic reset, if you will, if, if you will, uh, to make the system better, but not if you still think that I am the, I am the incarnation of righteousness. I'm the best. Everybody should be like me. I don't need to learn from you. You have to learn from me. And I export my ideology, my value, my, you know, <laughs> and the universal. Value. Okay, uh, the value is not the problem. The problem is, look at your own house. And, and how can you tell people that your value was good when your own house is a mess? And it's, I'm not talking about economically, I'm talking about politically. And so I think, and that's one reason why I believe that as America finally come to grips with that realization that it may just say to hell with it. I don't need the world. I'm one of the very, very few countries on earth that can live happily Thereafter, because I have enough water, I have enough food, I have enough energy, right? I have enough land, I have enough people. So, hey, I don't need the work. And that may be another thing that will cause America to retreat to isolationism. And what will happen to the world after that? It's going to be a splintered world. Yeah. Some people say, hey, China is going to it will, uh, 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 provide China with the best opportunity uh, to you know, replace America. Whoever said that doesn't know a hill of beans about China. Yeah. And they they use their pea brain to estimate other people's brains. Yeah. Think that they are that stupid to want to do that? Yeah. 
I don't think so. I agree. You know, so, you know, of course, then you have the, the media, <laughs> which is another story, but they want to get into that, uh, which is just totally lies. You know, every day you read the newspaper, it's just lie, lie, and lie. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Ronnie, I agree and, with you. Know, you supposedly, know. China is a place that you only see all the, the stories only about how good the Communist Party is and this and that. Well, they only report on one side, perhaps. They don't report on the bad side. True. But in the West nowadays, it is blatant neglect of the truth. A black can be called a white. Uh, something black can be called a white, and a white can be called black. And do you think that mankind can end well when that is the case? Do you think an individual can end well that way, or do you think a nation can can work can end well that way? I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I going back to what you were saying. Like you, I share the view that the last thing China wants is American isolationism and America to disengage with the world because it's the China is Chinese realized, recognized that it's much more important for America as an economy and as a state to be engaged with the world because right. that's burden sharing for as far as China is concerned. Good, Correct. but in within within the what we're seeing in 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 China, Ronnie. Do you, do you think that this housing bubble is coming to a head, uh, given your expertise? And the other thing that we're seeing right now is what seems to be this, this logjam in managing COVID restrictions. Are these two problems manageable um, for China? And is there a way forward? Well, first of all, on the residential real estate <clears throat> problem, uh, I, for the last seven, eight, nine years, have been saying it publicly that the model of the residential market in mainland China is unsustainable. Anybody can see it. Just that not too, too, not too many people talk about it. And if you're a player therein, it was just having too good of a good time. Uh, that is until the good time ends. And I, so I've been saying that it is not sustainable. I just don't know why the Chinese government doesn't act earlier and why do they let the bubble you know, get to be so big and the later and bigger the bubble is, uh, the later you poke it and the, 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 the more long lasting is the consequences and the more problem you're going to have. And so I think at the end of the day, I suspect that the problem is still manageable from a financial perspective, but it will hurt the economy because mainly because you know, confidence is a fragile thing anywhere in the world. And uh, when you have a big economy, a big industry like residential real estate in the mainland of China, get into that kind of a difficult situation, uh, you know, it, it affects the psychology of uh, everybody in China. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it, it's going to have lasting effect. But at least financially, I think it's a manageable process. So I don't think that financially is going to get the country into trouble. SARS is a is a different story. I think a lot of the the, the world don't quite understand why China is doing what they are doing. I'm only guessing. I'm only analyzing. Um, I may be wrong, but I can understand um, something about why they are doing what they are doing. And I don't know if that's a question that you want to get into, but anyway, so it's uh, I'll be led by you. No, please, Ronnie, if you have, because again, back to your point about the coverage of media, you're sitting in Hong Kong, you're in proximity of the motherland and mainland, and you understand the dynamics far better than us and many of our audience, right? So from this side, it's all oh, prolonged two and a half years, three years, if you have any nuggets of wisdom, which I'm sure you do, please share on how it's being managed and why. And then I have a couple of other questions. But please go on. Don't don't stop there. I'll summarize what I think is the case. Okay, there's just one man's analysis. <clears throat> uh, first of all, the age old way to deal with any pandemic or even epidemic is lockdown, isolation, quarantine. Okay. So historically, that's how mankind for the last 
2,000 years has been doing, right? And they have been successful. The first year before the, 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 the vaccine came out, before the testing kits came out, the first year, China was very, very successful. I don't know where the COVID, the COVID virus come from. It was first reported in China, right? I have heard of cases in Oregon, in, uh, in South Africa, in London, and wherever else. I don't know. But wherever it is, China was the first one to report on it in Wuhan. And so they use the HO method because they, have, they don't have any other method. There's no vaccine in those days. So, and they've been successful. And once you've been successful, it's not that easy for you to change course. That's one reason, but that's not the only one, right? Number two, they didn't use mRNA, or at least they didn't have mRNA. And um, perhaps they thought they could develop it, but so far I have not heard of uh, final success yet. And so they do it to tra tra traditional way. And by the way, none of us know the long, uh, long-term effect of mRNA vaccine. It's just that I, although I don't know it, I choose it rather than the long COVID. So <laughs> either way, you're dead, but possibly, right? So I take the unknown evil rather than the known evil. And so I took, got three shots, right? So they don't have the mRNA and that is not, effect, not that effective, let's face it. And the mRNA turned out to be very effective, right? 94, 95% effective, whereas the Chinese is much, much lower. And... <clears throat> So why don't they buy it? Well, don't forget, this is in the, in, 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 in the context of United States trying to get you. And when they say try to get you, it's not fun, right? What if you, 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 you import uh, mRNA vaccines and, you know, after 20% of the people are vaccinated with it, not to mention the loss of foreign sub currency, uh, suddenly America said no more. You can have a problem domestically, socially. Right, so the Chinese leaders have to think of that as well, and then the Chinese people. They love to go to hospitals. Then the slightest uh, physical issue, they go to a hospital, and unlike in the West, which has you know clinics and you try to push things away from the hospitals, if if you can handle it another way, such as local uh, regional clinics and the uh, communal clinics, clinics or doctor's office, and now even the internet, right. Uh, but the Chinese are not like that. Anything happened, they have to go to the hospital. And if the doctor doesn't prescribe something for them, such as just give them some drip, 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 okay? Uh, they don't think that the doctor is doing anything for them. So they would suffer pain uh -huh, just to think that they are, so that psychologically think that they're, they're being treated, right? Or some kind of pop of food, pill, pills of this and that. And the Chinese hospital is really, really uh, behind very packed already. And if you have, uh, you know, COVID, such as what happened in the West, uh, can the uh, healthcare system cope with it? I think it will be really, really challenging. And it can become a, uh, a, um, a uh, big social problem, mm -hmm. right? I always say that, you know, in the West, uh, as long as you, you pay tax, you can, you know, the government doesn't promise you anything. You don't promise that government. You don't have allegiance to the government, right? Uh, just get off my back, especially in America, right? Want the government off their back. And European country as well. Whereas the Chinese system or from, from, from time, time immemorial is the government has to take up the people and you have to be loyal to the government. And that's still the case in China today. So the Chinese leaders have to take care of the life of the people. And turn the clock back, and the Chinese have been very successful in that. Whereas America has, as of today, has over a million people died. In China, it's still only, what, 6,000 or whatever, the, 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 it's a dinky little number, right? And so they did protect the lives of the citizens. But then, at what cost? Mm -hmm. And I think that the social unrest of late may be one thing, one key thing that may force China to, to, to change. But then they would have to very carefully uh, uh, craft a message to the people that if that's what you want, there may be the death rate may go up tremendously, right? 
and, and you better be prepared for it. Before you ask, you better know what you're asking for because there are other issues involved. So, you know, they are, they are in, put in a very, very difficult position. Finally, let me just say one, uh, one other little flip thing. You know, America and China have about the same land mass, right? But China has over four times the population. So if, if one million people die in America, uh, all things else being equal, there'll be four million people that die in China, right? But then 50% of the pop, uh, 90, 94% of the population lives on 50% of the land, okay? East of a line, northeast to southwest, uh, east of that line. So that actually they are 94% live in half the size of the United States. So maybe it is not 4 million, maybe it's 6 million, 8 million, right? And then the, the effectiveness, uh, and then people live in horizontal, right? Uh, the big cities, everybody live in high rise. And by the way, I'm on the 78th floor right now, right? Wow. Uh, I'll show you the view after the meeting. It's beautiful. Anyway, so, and when you live in high rise, you know, it's a lot uh, in highly dense uh, conditions, you know, it, it spread faster. So the number at the end may be 15 million, 20 million. Is China ready for that? Can this healthcare system cope with it, right? And so there's a lot of things uh, that the Chinese uh, leaders must be considering uh, when they make that decision. Uh, but, you know, things changes, uh, things change and, you know, Omicron is less uh, deadly. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, if, if, if you believe in Anthony Fauci, hey, we're, we're not out of the woods yet. And what if, see, the Chinese don't have the Im immunity. And, and by the way, if you think that any country can make people take a shot, you don't know China. <laughs> if people don't want to take a shot, people <laughs> don't take a shot. Yeah. And you can put them in jail. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. 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 Right? So, yeah. so the, the China is a complicated place. Anyway, yeah. so I think that, you know, um, China, Chinese people have very little immunity because they have been so good. Only a couple of thousand people died instead of a million, two million, five million, ten million, right? And so they have no immunity. So what if the whole thing spread and it evolved into, you know, something more deadly than Omicron? Is it possible? Yeah. I talked to some yeah. experts. They say it's possible. I said, oh, gosh, it's scared out of me. So yeah. what should I wish for? Doesn't matter. What I wish for doesn't matter. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm just observing that. So. Yeah. Uh, Ronnie, Ronnie, I, 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 I think the world needs to be very worried about infection rates rising in China, because China is a linchpin, not just politically, historically, but also economically. And, and that kind of tragedy befalling on China will have long-term implications for how China engages with the world, but also for the rest of the world. It's, it's like making a very heavyweight lever go up and down in, in water, which caused massive displacement. So I think we are all very concerned about what's going on in China. And like you, I think we all worry about, you know, the leadership is stuck between the rock and the hard place. There are no easy ways out. But right. what seems to be happening is society is beginning to derive its own conclusions that they want a third option. And, and it's very difficult to craft that in the current conditions, in my view. Correct. I, I, I'm in full agreement with you. Ronnie, I, I, I couldn't uh, um, wish for uh, anything but hopefully a, a, another comeback on our program soon in 2023. But I normally bring our sessions to an end with a standard question, which you will have in a minute. But talking about middle powers, before that, this is my last question. Normally, Anoush packs two questions in one, but I have, I have the closing today. I'm being naughty. The world needs a neutral. You are cheating, Borhan. You are cheating. <laughs> the the world needs a neutral, effective, and trusted middle power where these two big powers can come and talk. I find it very difficult today in this polarized bifurcation of these two. Where would that city state be? Switzerland, even in the latest crisis between Ukraine and Russia, was pushed to you know steer away from its neutral stance. Where do you think in the middle powers these two can come sit down and have a decompressing session? That is my last question. And the standard question is, if you were to leave 
our audience, the cinephobes and cinephiles, each of them with one piece of advice from your wisdom, what would that be to each camp? Well, let me start with your last question. I think to the uh, son of folks, the, the one who are afraid of China, I think they really owe it to themselves to go to China and try to understand China a little. Don't don't rely on the, the media. The media is just is just propagating of lies and lies and lies. And you know, you owe it to your, owe it to yourself to, to find out yourself. Go there, live there, you know, visit there, right? Uh, for some time. Uh, to the Sanofiles, uh, they are, they are uh, I, I can't find one with a binocular in the West. I don't know where they are. Uh, they are I used to have a big group of friends and now they are dropping off like flies. Uh, and so I don't know where they are anymore. There's a few, I, I know that, but not that many. And, uh, you know, these days is McCarthyism of the 1950s back big time. In the 1950s, there was still some pushback on McCarthyism. Now there's almost no pushback in America. And, uh, you know, talking about no freedom of speech, you know, you can do it the Chinese way or you can do it the American way. And, and I think the American way is far superior. Uh, and... And, and, and today, you know, you don't hear any diverse views anymore. Uh, and I, I don't know where it will come from. Uh, and that goes back to your first question, question, and that is, you know, who can be the middle power that can play some role? Um, I don't see any, mm -hmm. frankly. Uh, this is very few countries that both sides can trust. Uh, I will give you one, uh, or, or there are some small countries like Singapore, right? Uh, I, I'm going to name one that the Chinese won't like. Uh, can India? India, you say? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that's very, how do you say, uh, creative, Ronnie. And I, and I agree with you because, <laughs> but, but that's very creative of you, as always. <laughs> anyway, good talking to you guys. And if you... Ron, Ronnie, you're, you're absolutely right in, in trying to identify a, a, a kind of a, a, not just a middle power, but a middle mediator. But there is there is history, if, if, you, if you like, that term between China and India that, that needs to be um, cleared up before Beijing I... begins to... Yeah, to look at India. I know that. That's why I said Beijing will not like. Yeah, but, but, but what, you, what you highlight is the paucity of medi mediating powers in there, which is really worrisome. We we I love to end on a on a high our dialogues. Uh, you have managed to lower the mood, but what you've told us though is so insightful and energetically exciting that I'm prepared to let that one go and and focus on the many issues that you've discussed with us. The question of trust of distribution of trust around the world and the way in which powers interact with each other that they need to have their own houses in order but also be mindful of what the other parties are going through what is their political culture and how they come about interacting with each other and in way in the way that you've put it out you know the world needs to recognize the the gravity of China, as well as its gravitas. And in some ways, the message doesn't get out of Beijing properly. And, and it remains a, a, a matter for the rest of us to try and bring to light the enormity of Chinese civilization, but also the humbleness of the Chinese way of dealing with things. And those things you've demonstrated perfectly in, in, in your articulation of the issues. So we are really grateful to have you on our program. Uh, and, and we would love to have you again in the new year. And I know that you have a dinner date and I've invited myself as well. I'm dressed for it. So I'll be in Hong Kong in no time to join you for dinner. 
much but, obliged to Ronnie Chan for being our guest. Thank you, Ronnie. It's the year of rabbit upon us, and I wanted to wish you and the team at Hang Long as well prosperity, peace at large for China and the world, and grateful to have you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.